dressed. Why are math, math textbooks always so stressed? What's that? They have to deal with so many problems. Very well done. Very well done. Okay. What did the apple tree say to the farmer? What did the apple tree say to the farmer? Stop picking on me. This one's fresh off the press. This one's, they're learning and they're growing and they're knowledge based. Okay, here we go. Helium and hydrogen atom are floating around in space. Helium says to the hydrogen, I think I've lost my electron. Hydrogen says, are you sure? Helium says what? I'm positive. Yeah, I'm positive. <laughs> Now they know it all. <laughs> Let's talk about the exam for a bit. Okay, what happens a week from today? Exam two. I believe Friday is our drop de deadline. Am I accurate on that? Okay, let me just double check. Yep. The first of November. So let me explain to you how that works. Now would be a great time to kind of calculate where you are in the class. All right, we've got, what, eight or nine pre-quizzes and post-quizzes by the end of, by Friday. Um, remember, we drop your lowest of each, and some of you are grateful for that, and I get it, right? Everyone, we have, all have bad weeks, uh, so we get some freebies. Um, so you can calculate your grade, and you've got two more exams. So you got a few more quizzes pre and post, and you got two more exams. Exam's not till Monday, and your drop deadline is Friday. So now is a strategic time to figure out realistically where you're at and how you're doing. Does that make sense? I'm not allowed to email grades out. Some of, some of you guys, we worked on this in office hours today. Um, so if you email me, I can't, I can't email you your grade. I can't do the calculation, we're not allowed to. It's a, there's a law in 1974 called the Purple Law, um, and so we're it, it protects your privacy, and so we're not allowed to uh, post grades according to your name or any identifier. And email is not a secure transmission form, so I you know I don't know if your roommate or you know mom or dad is stalking you and wanting to know what your grades are. Um, I'm not allowed to share with you what mom and you know with mom and dad what your grades are. That's you know now that you're adults, that's that's protected by that 1974 law. So, it's very simple though. Take total number of points, you multiply it by 0.895, if you want an A, if you want to earn an A, total number of points times 895. Why is multiplier times 895? Because that's the cutoff, it's 89.5%. That'll tell you the total number of points that you need to earn an A. If there is a decimal, like let's say you need 200, in 1.6 points, round up, okay? Round up, play it safe. Um, and then you calculate the total number of points that you have, less that, and then that's how many points you need on the remaining assignments. 200 of the remaining points are exams. And then the other points come from the quizzes, okay? So you're gonna have to do a little mathematics here, but it's not that complicated. 0.795 or 0.895 is an A, 0.795 is for a B, okay, and so on and so forth. You guys with me? So, there isn't something magical that's going to change with respect to extra credit. Like if you shovel my driveway, if we have a big winter, I'm sorry, one, I really appreciate it, but there's no extra bonus points for that, okay? So, we said this the first day of class, and I'm going to hold true to that. But now you have this week to kind of contemplate, okay, do I want it? withdraw from the class or do I want to continue? You guys follow? So this is an important week to kind of make that decision. The second exam can look very much like the first exam. Similar format. And you'll have 50 multiple choice. Uh, you'll see some images on the screen. Have two versions. You guys know the drill. Um, if you have questions, please ask. Okay. If you are not satisfied with my answer, it is fine if you want to ask Ryan, okay? 
and, and the opposite is true. There's nothing wrong with that. But you'll probably get a similar answer from mom and dad. You know what I mean? Like if you go to mom, she says, you know, no, no radar movies. Uh, dad's probably gonna say the same thing. But um, if it's confusing, if I'm saying it in a confusing way, you just want clarity. Raise your hand and say, hey, could, can I just ask the same thing to Ryan? Just, maybe I'm just not understanding what you're saying. I don't want this to be confusing, okay? You guys with me? Um, review topics, they'll be up to 10%, so that means up to five questions we'll review, that's it. 10% of 50 is five. So if I only have five questions to ask, <laughs> and you thought about unit one, and you've been doing the flashcard thing, you know, there's there's only a few key topics that, that I can cover. You guys follow? So we're not gonna get into granular detail. We're gonna stay pretty pretty top level, you know, things on inflammation and you know subjects that are as important as that. Any questions about Monday? Sweet, so we've got to finish up endocrine, and we'll have today, and then we'll have Wednesday, and, and this is all in the exam, and you have a long, you have a weekend, I say the long weekend, you have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, at least from my perspective. If you have class on Thursday, Friday with other teachers, um, you know, I, I, I don't control that. As far as I'm concerned, you have a four day weekend. You do have post quiz on Friday, don't forget that. Okay, but then next week, right, Kind of have a lighter week, if you will, after the exam. Uh, we will have class on Wednesday of next week. We'll dive into new material. Uh, let me take a look. I haven't looked that far. That far. Let's see. What oh, renal. So we're in on renal next week, but you don't have a pre-quiz next week. So um, we'll start next week. We'll have uh, our exam on Monday. We'll have a renal lecture on Wednesday, and then the following Monday we have Veterans Day. We have the day off. Okay. And um, there are a couple of, of uh, service people in this classroom, so we really do appreciate your guys' uh, service that gives us the opportunity to do what we do. Um, so Monday, Veterans Day, um, say thank you to a man or woman in uniform, okay, or that wears the uniform. Any questions about the schedule? And then after Monday, like we're on the downward slope, it's gonna go fast. You'd be surprised at how quickly we'll wind this thing up. Okay, I mean, we're all, I can't believe we're almost done. It's like crazy. So, but before we finish, let's talk about endocrine. And <clears throat> endocrine as a terminology means something very specific. And the endocrine system is a system of glandular structures and these structures are designed to secrete some type of signaling molecule, usually we refer to it as a hormone. And that goes into the bloodstream. And in the bloodstream, it circulates around and it can bind to a receptor and it can stimulate some type of activity. And the beauty of the endocrine system is you get a broad effect. You get a broad effect, meaning you release a compound into the bloodstream, it circulates around the entire organism, and it doesn't happen fast, bless you, but it does happen globally. So the endocrine system is a global, broad signaling system to get the entire organism to do something, respond. So one of the best examples that I think characterizes the endocrine system is puberty. Wouldn't it be nice if puberty happened overnight? Huh? You know, awkward changes in the voice, right? You None know, of the pimple stuff, right? Things just are there, <laughs> okay? It's not like this awkward transition out of a million and 17 questions coming from your adolescence, right? Because I'm supposedly the subject matter expert, so I get all the questions, right? Oh. <laughs> Ask your mom, okay. Um, so puberty doesn't happen overnight. But look at what happens to the entire organism. You take a child, and now you have an adult, okay? And puberty lasts a period of time. Um, 
Another example, uh, pregnancy, okay, hormonally regulated. <clears throat> Does not happen overnight. Nine months, some pretty amazing, arguably miraculous things happen in nine months that blows your mind when you start studying it, right? Um, but it doesn't happen overnight. So let's contrast, before we contrast the exocrine, let's contrast it, contrast it with an other system that has the opportunity to cause changes, but it happens locally and it happens quickly. And that's the nervous system. So a lot of textbooks will contrast the endocrine system to the nervous system because they're almost very different like polar opposites. You got the endocrine that goes slowly but broadly and you have the nervous system that's very specific or targeted, but yet it's quick, okay? So we got muscle contraction, right? So it's not like if I wanna move from here to there and it's an endocrine system that I use, it doesn't take me nine months to get over there, right? That would, that would kind of suck, right? Just to push to the next slide. So we've got two very different modalities that regulate us. And we're here to talk about the endocrine system, but I want to compare and contrast it to some other systems that you're familiar with. So do you kind of see what the utility is? Why it exists the way it exists? Um, so let's talk about exocrine. It's, it's a very similar term, but it means something completely different. So exocrine glands, secrete products, not into the bloodstream, but they secrete them out into the external environment. So they're gonna use a duct system that, move, that secretes onto usually epithelial surface. So think about exocrine, exocrine sweat glands or exocrine secretion of certain um, uh, digestive enzymes that go out, technically the lumen of the GI tract is outside the body, you guys remember that? So if you're secreting exocrine digestive enzymes, uh, like pancreatic um, amylase, it, it's released by the pancreas, the exocrine function of the pancreas, that releases it into the duodenum, and that helps to stimulate digestion, right? Or um, uh, digestion specifically of fats. So exocrine and endocrine sound very similar, but they're very different. The neural system or the nervous system and the endocrine system operate very differently. So let's talk about a couple other terms that are familiar or similar, paracrine and autocrine. Who can define paracrine and autocrine for me? You've seen these before. Uh, like chemical signals, um, either from like a cell, cells nearby, or a cell that's like triggering itself. Okay, so which one's which? Uh, so autocrine would be at the cell, and then paracrine would be at the cell triggering other cells around or Perfect. signaling. Autocrine means self, so you release a, a molecule or a signaling agent, it binds to the same cell and it causes an activity, that's autocrine. Paracrine, release an enzyme or a signaling molecule and it binds to a nearby cell and it causes it to do something, an adjacent cell. Big difference between paracrine and autocrine. Okay, so let's talk now about some classes of endocrine hormones. And we're gonna talk about TOR on this particular slide. So we have peptides, steroids, monoamines, and, and eicosanoids. So peptides, these are smaller fragments of proteins. You all probably know what peptides are. And they're secreted into the bloodstream. So an example is like the anterior pituitary gland will um, manufacture prolactin. Prolactin is a peptide that is being made by the anterior pituitary gland and it's going to stimulate milk letdown. The posterior pituitary gland um, secretes a substance known as antidiuretic hormone, ADH. Antidiuretic hormone, ADH, um, also known as vas vasopressin, and it, it acts to conserve water. Okay, those are peptides. Those are a fragment of a protein. A steroid. Steroids an organic compound and it contains a specific arrangement of, um, of um, cholesterol that can be used to manufacture other types of steroidal hormones. And so from cholesterol, which is a cycloalkane, you can generate estradiol, 
and you can uh, generate testosterone. So those are the sex hormones that command uh, adolescent changes in females and males, respectively. Estradiol for females and testosterone for males. Monoamines. So monoamines, um, an example would be like norepinephrine and epinephrine. These monoamines usually come from tyrosine. And monoamines like norepinephrine and epinephrine um, are utilized in our sympathetic nervous system. And monoamines like norepinephrine and epinephrine are released, and this is an interaction between the nervous system and our endocrine system. So monoamines are very important for our fight or flight response. How many of you woke up in the middle of the night to a smoke alarm? Nobody? Okay, a couple of you. Yeah. How did that make you feel? Excited. Excited. Okay, that's a good term. Some of you were scared out of your mind, right? Some were pissed. Okay. What, what happened to your heart rate? Yeah, it went through the roof. Okay. So you wake up in the middle of the night, smoke alarm, and does your heart rate go through the roof instantaneously? Or does it or, or is it like a couple of seconds later after you realize what's going on, then all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, I can feel my heart rate starting to increase, right? So that ramp up feeling is these monoamines, these norepinephrine and epinephrine response that's systemic throughout the entire body. And you're like, I am now awake. So that's an example of how the nervous system and the endocrine system you know, overlap, but you're getting these broad-based effects from these monoamines um, that come from tyrosine. Last family of hormones. Again, hormones are signaling molecules. Signaling molecules. Now, oftentimes they're proteins, but not always. We've got steroids, we've got monoamines, and we have what are called eicosanoids. Eicosanoids are 20 carbon chain molecules that come from our friend, arachidonic acid. So these eicosanoids, you could name four at a minimum. Give them to me. Prostaglandin, prostacycline, thromboxane, uh, what was the last one? Leukotrienes, very good, leukotrienes. So all of these that are derived from arachidonic acid in this eicosanoid family are in this classi classification of a signaling molecule. Now, if you think back to the inflammatory lecture, I didn't tell you that they were eicosanoids, and I didn't tell you that they were hormones, and I didn't tell you that they're part of signaling. But if you look back now, what you know, and what you're learning today, does it make sense? Can you connect the dots? Yeah, so what's the signal that you're trying to send? when you generate a hormone known as prostaglandin, prostacycline, leukotriene, or thromboxane from arachidonic acid. What are you signaling? What are you trying to do? An inflammatory response. You're trying to get the vessel to do something, right? And it's a fairly broad-based signal depending upon where that thing is being released, okay? So these Endocrine functions, I think, is one of the more complicated systems in the body, and that's why we're kind of walking through it fairly slowly. So let's talk about mode of action. So the whole concept is with the endocrine system, with hormone signaling is, can I release a small amount of material and generate a very broad effect? And that's what this graph is trying to illustrate. So for example, we've got a small stimulus with a, with a hormone, and we utilize a cascade system like cyclic AMP and protein kinase. It activates uh, enzymes, creates a metabolic product, and you get a great effect. So let's look at two examples, right? We've got two examples here of an upregulation and a downregulation. We've got a hormone, which are those little blue dots, and then we've got the receptor, which are the purple structures on the surface of the cell. So these cells have some generic receptor, and here's the nucleus, 
generic receptor at the surface that the hormone has specificity for. The hormone has direct specificity for that receptor and only that receptor. And when it binds, it may only bind one or two. And, and that's it. Then it becomes what we call saturated. And it can't bind anymore. It has like so many buses. Okay? So if you want to increase your response, because you have saturation and you want to upregulate, you need to tell the nucleus, make me some more receptors so I can bind more signals. And so the one way to upregulate is to increase the number of receptors that are inserted at the cell membrane. Likewise, if you want to uh, downregulate, because of the specificity and because of the saturation capabilities, if you remove receptors, you're going to lower the response. So we've got upregulation and downregulation of that particular signal. Does that make sense? Pretty straightforward. Now, with amplification, you could have a situation where you could increase the number of receptors, and, and in order to amplify it, instead of doing that, you could actually start manufacturing new receptors that bind to other molecules that help to exaggerate the same response, and that would be considered amplification. Okay, we'll talk about amplifying signals here in a minute, but uh, two molecules that kind of have this sort of effect um, are progesterone and estrogen, okay? So estrogen helps to amplify the signals for progesterone and vice versa. All right, so let's talk about, in that vein, terms like synergistic, antagonistic, and permissive. So synergistic, there's a lot of white space because I want you to write. There, there's a lot of white space here where you can say synergistic means, who can define what synergistic is? Greater than the sum of its parts. Greater than the sum of its parts, well done. So if one plus one equals four, that's synergistic math, okay? That's what you'd like to see on your paycheck, right? Mm -hmm. Synergistic yeah. numbers. Uh, additive would be one plus one is two. Synergistic is one plus one equals four. So for example, follicle stimulating hormone plus testosterone <coughs> is an example of a synergistic effect on sperm production. You need to have follicle stimulating hormone and then you, in the presence of testosterone, leads to appropriate levels of, of sperm production. What's appropriate? Well, in order for fertilization and viable sperm to be manufactured. Antagonistic. Antagonistic is what? What's it word? What's that word mean? Uh, like one down regulates the other, or one blocks the other. Yeah, opposite. One down regulates, one uh, up regulates. Down regulates, up regulates. So they have opposing actions. So <clears throat> insulin, for example, lowers blood glucose levels whereas glucagon increases blood glucose levels. So those are two great examples of antagonistic effects. Insulin lowers blood glucose, and glucagon uh, raises blood glucose. And then permissive. Permissive. This is kind of like the amplification example that I said on the previous slide. So, one hormone enhances a target's response to a second hormone, like in the case of estrogen and progesterone. So estrogen stimulates the upregulation of progesterone receptors in the uterus. And so in the menstrual cycle, once, once a month, the estrogen and progesterone fluctuations are permissive activities, where one is actually helping to augment or encourage the other one's activity. That's permissive. And therefore, you amplify the signal. This particular slide is here um, to remind me, to remind you of how complicated this system really is. So this is one of the classic examples that engineers have a tough time 
putting a header out. Right? I mean, in the bioengineering phase, space, I either deal with biologists or I deal with engineers. And, and this is a slide that is like the epitome of the biologist, right? In the mind of the engineer. Like, they would ask a question. Um, so, which one of these networks does the pituitary gland control? Yes, with the biologist answer, B. Oh, um, well, when does it do which one? Yes, it does all of them, all the time. Well, how does, how does it know? Well, it depends. What do you mean it depends? Like, how much of prolactin does it release? Well, it, it, it depends on when we're talking about. What time of the month? Is there a pregnancy? Is there not a pregnancy? Is it a male? Is it a female? So the engineer's like, uh, okay, I can't model this. Okay, I need to know like 1.2 or 1.7, which is the number, okay? So I want to point this to you because you know the hypothalamus, which is part of the brain, it influences with the releasing hormones, the pituitary gland. And you've got two main parts of the pituitary. You've got the anterior and you've got the posterior. And the anterior pituitary gland is truly an endocrine organ. And the anterior pituitary gland has these different axes that control mammary gland activity, thyroid, testes, ovaries, right? The adrenal cortex, liver, as well as fat, bone, and muscle. And so the pituitary gland is kind of like the master gland that's signaling all of these systems around the body. And so if we have, for example, which came out of cancer, if we have a lesion in the brain, let's say in the hypothalamus, what's going to happen? Well, it, it depends. Right? If we have a lesion in the anterior pituitary, what's going to happen? Well, it depends. But if you have a lesion in either the hypothalamus or the anterior pituitary, could you actually have effects downstream in any one of these pathways? Absolutely. So pituitary function and a tumor or a lesion or trauma or disease of the pituitary gland or the hypothalamus can manifest itself in so many different ways. You with me? And so, I mean, you're all over the place. I mean, you're in reproductive organs, you're in fat, bone, muscle, right? I mean, it's, it, it, this is an extremely complicated field when you're dealing with the endocrine system. And stuff happens, and we're gonna talk about specific diseases, but I just wanna pause and, and, and try to get the introduction set it up where it's important for you to take a global picture and recognize, wow, there's so many moving parts here. Like when this structure, or this system, excuse me, when this system is operational and functional, we don't give it much thought. It's when something goes wrong that we start going, oh man, I wonder where the problem is. Well now you've got a detective amount of work that's required that's pretty huge in order to figure this out. So we're gonna walk through some of these, but I'm gonna point you back to this map, this road map, it's gonna give you, I think, that perspective of, wow, okay, now I kind of see down this axis what's actually happening. So, wouldn't be a bad idea, and you guys have seen, you know, some of these, this is a clean one. There's some more risque versions of this on, online, but um, the hormones of the anterior pituitary gland. Frank likes taking showers so that he appears clean, tall, handsome, and professional. So, FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, somato uh, somatotropic hormone, or human growth hormone, and then um, adrenal cort uh, cortisol hormone, and then prolactin. All of these come from the anterior pituitary. So let's zoom in on the anterior pituitary um, and the hypothalamus. Again, 
Uh, the hypothalamus, right, hypo means under, and so the hypothalamus is a chamber that's underneath the thalamus, so it's in the brain. And the, the hypothalamus um, has activity that controls what? Pituitary gland, but, but overall the hypothalamus is known as, as what functionality? It regulates homeostasis, thank you. So it's called the homeostatic center, the hypothalamus. And, and it controls all sorts of different activities, including initiating activity through its influence on the anterior pituitary. So the anterior pituitary is truly part of the endocrine system. It's got a portal network um, of venules that it uses to propagate the signal. And so you've got these porty, portal venules that move into this capillary network. Again, this is the vascular supply. So then these hormones are being released, they go in to the venous circulation and then they get propagated throughout the body. Now in contrast, and you can see this pink box, all the different, you know, Frank likes taking showers. Um, so these are all the different hormones, FSH, luteinizing har hormone, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, adrenal corticotropic hormone, prolactin, and growth hormone. All of these are being manufactured by the anterior pituitary. This is all review, right? Um, and the hypothalamus has these releasing hormones that cause these uh, stimulating hormones to be released, and then it goes throughout the body like what you saw on this particular axis. Now if you look at the posterior pituitary, the posterior pituitary is actually kind of a bulge of the brain that comes out. These are axonal projections that come down. So it's really not considered endocrine, the posterior pituitary. So when you learn in 202 of the non-endocrine activities of the posterior pituitary, that is accurate. I mean, it's really neuronal. Uh, these are axons that are bundled into this pouch known as the posterior pituitary. It's also referred to as the neurohypothesis. The neurohypothesis. And there's only two compounds that are released. We call them hormones, but it's really a misnomer because they're not really hormones because they don't really go through that normal um, portal system circulation. They eventually make it to the bloodstream and they circulate, so it is a hormonal circulation or endocrine circulation, but they come out of these neurons. And so oxytocin, that stimulates uterine contractions and lactation in pregnant women. And then vasopressin. Vasopressin, also known as antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. We kind of already talked about that. All right, you guys on track? Questions so far? So as you guys can appreciate, we go through kind of a rapid review, or a more extensive rapid review, on topics that I feel we need to make sure we have a solid, firm foundation. Maybe it's been a couple semesters since you take a 202, or you know maybe you took it at a different institution, or you know maybe you slept through all of 202. I, I don't know what the answer is, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay, so now we're going to start getting into the last part of today. We'll start getting into a couple of clinical examples before we stop for the day. <coughs> Endocrine disorders, these really can be categorized in a couple of different ways. Now, usually it's either an impaired synthesis or there's some abnormal interaction between the hormone and the target organ, or the target organ has a weird or an abnormal response. So let's look at each one of these. Impaired synthesis, it can be too much, hyper, or it can be too little. So think about um, like the anterior pituitary. If it take, makes too much of a releasing hormone, right? You might get too much thyroid uh, or thyroid stimulating hormone. It makes too much thyroid stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary. You might have the thyroid gland making too much thyroid hormone. Okay, and thyroid hormone regulates metabolism, and so metabolism is way high. An individual is, is you know, hyperthyroid, 
talked about this in a minute. Or it could be too little. It makes too little thyroid stimulating hormone and the thyroid gland doesn't make enough thyroid hormone and now the patient is hypothyroid. Um, oftentimes, with these endocrine disorders, we've got what's called an ectopic foci. And that means that there's some lesion. And so the reason that I do the endocrine lecture following a cancer lecture um, is because oftentimes in endocrine dysfunction, not always, but oftentimes, there is some sort of lesion, either in the brain or in one of these particular centers that are causing um, a local or an ectopic foci problem. And oftentimes it's hyperactive. It's hyperactive. Okay, second, you've got abnormal interactions between the hormone and the target organ. The hormone binds the target organ and too much signal takes place. Or um, why would there why would be too much signal uh, uh, happening, like with HER2? Well, uh, epidermal growth factor binds to the receptor. If there's too many receptors, like in the case of cancer in the breast tissue, now you get the, the cancer lesion in the breast tissue grow. That's an abnormal interaction. Um, could be an abnormal target organ response, um, where uh, maybe there's a growth factor that binds and it triggers extensive vascularization of that tissue, which allows for the tumor mass to continue to grow. That's an abnormal target organ response. So if we look at the hypothalamus, its main duty we talked about, its main role is being the homeostatic center of the brain. So it regulates things like body temperature, thirst, hunger, Hypothalamus, right, from the Greek, um, meaning under or a room underneath or a chamber underneath the thalamus. Right? That's what it literally translates to. So it's located anatomically just below the thalamus. And just below the thalamus, there's interesting things going on. So here we've got our thalamus, and we've got the hypothalamus just below it. And you can ap appreciate that there's the optic chiasm right here. So if you get a lesion in the hypothalamus, this might put pressure on the optic chiasm and cause vision problems. Okay. The hypothalamus sits just superior to the pituitary gland. And the, you know this pituitary gland kind of sits in the center of the brain, just above or superior to the navel cavity. Higher magnification view, the pituitary gland sits or rests in the sphenoid bone. You guys remember that? This is like the silica tursica of the sphenoid bone, which means like saddle, what it translates to. So, so you basically, it's called that because look at how it just sort of sits and rests right in that little sac, okay, or spot. Um, you know, the an adenohypothesis, or the anterior, uh, is toward the front, and then the posterior uh, uh, a pituitary, or the neurohypothesis, is toward the posterior aspect. So the hormones that are being manufactured out of the hypothalamus are releasing hormones. These releasing hormones, like GHRH, is growth hormone releasing hormone growth hormone releasing hormone, or the inhibitory version, growth hormone inhibitory hormone, also referred to as somatostatin. PRF is an abbreviation for prolactin, PIF, or dopamine. PIF is the prolactin inhibitory factor. GNRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone. TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone. And then corticotropin releasing hormone. So this is what the hypothalamus makes. And it has activity on the pituitary gland, particularly the anterior pituitary gland. So the question I have for you, if you had an adenoma in the pituitary gland, which part 
of the pituitary would you anticipate this would be found if it's an endocrine disorder? Anterior. Anterior, very good. Anterior. And we'll classify these adenomas of the pituitary, the anterior pituitary, the endocrine functioning part of the pituitary, uh, in three ways. And the ways that we classify them are um, by the type of hormone that's being produced. So if it's a functional adenoma, it's the hormone is produced and it has clinical effects. Functional means hormone is produced, has clinical effects. So an adenoma is a lesion, right? A cancerous lesion. If it's a silent adenoma, there's hormone produced, but it does not have clinical effects. Like there's something wrong with the hormone. It's made and it doesn't have activity. It's mutates. Well, it came from mutated tissue, right? Because there was an adenoma, so it's not always going to produce functional product. Make sense? And then what do you think hormone negative refers to? Normal, no hormone is actually manufactured. Very, very straightforward, very simple. So silent is the hormone's made, but it doesn't work. And hormone negative means it doesn't even make the hormone. It's like one level beyond silent. Okay, so let's talk about the clinical manifestations. And we're first focused on our pituitary gland. And so we're gonna look at some diseases associated with the pituitary gland as we kind of rack up, wrap up today. And that's the organ, the target organ that we're focusing on. And then we'll come back to some of the other organs on Wednesday, like the pancreas, okay, and others, okay? But for now, we're talking about pituitary. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, thyroid gland on Wednesday, okay? We're just gonna get through the pituitary in the remaining time that we have. So, clinical manifestations. There could be mass effects of the pituitary gland with a lesion, an adenoma. Or, there could be trauma, a car accident, and the pituitary gland is damaged, okay? Uh, there could be surgical injury. There could be a brain hemorrhage. There could be a stroke, right? You have a stroke anywhere in the brain, including affecting parts of the pituitary gland. So we could have optic chiasm impingement. I already mentioned that, and that can affect vision. We can have some cranial nerve impingement, right? A cranial nerve, like, um, something that actually innervates a portion of the head and neck. You guys remember the 12 cranial nerves? Sort of, okay. Um, how about the vagus nerve? You guys remember the vagus nerve? So if you have an infarct or you have a stroke and you get vagal nerve trauma, the vagus nerve has innervations to the heart, thoracic cavity, and even parts of the abdominal cavity. That would be a bad one. Okay. You can have other ones like trigeminal nerve. You can have other ones um, like the vestibular cochlear nerve. The vestibular cochlear nerve feeds the inner ear, balance and hearing. So a patient could have trauma to the brain, cranial nerve impingement, or they could have an adenoma that affects the, tr uh, the vestibular cochlear nerve. And could they go deaf in one ear? Yeah, or both ears? Yeah. Could they have an altered sense of balance? Yeah. Is that a stroke or is that an adenoma? It could be either. You guys following like how complicated this particular part of the semester is? Let's pretend there's an adenoma in the anterior pituitary and it's hypersecreting. Now its manifestation is gonna depend on the type of hormone that it's actually manufactured because there's a whole handful of hormones that come out of the anterior pituitary. So we need to know which one of Frank taking a shower is being affected, right? Or the adenoma could put pressure, it could be a tumor that puts pressure on nearby tissue and it decreases hormone production in the surrounding anterior pituitary. Does that make sense? So you need to know some more details about this adenoma before you can determine what's going on. Let's talk about two clinical examples, okay, of the anterior pituitary. So, two clinical examples, they're just, 
designated by when they happen and age. So we've got giganticism, pituitary giganticism, and then we've got pituitary acromegaly. And giganticism is a disease where there's an adenoma or that's hypersecreting growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor. And growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor, they're coming out of the pituitary gland, have activity broadly throughout the body, and if it happens during childhood, then that child grows very, very large and quickly. And that's why it's called pituitary giganticism. Uh, there's a, a famous individual who's no longer with us, but uh, you guys remember the, the wrestler Andre the Giant, okay? Anybody seen Princess Bride? One of my favorite movies. He's in that movie, okay? So you should watch that movie because it's related to pathology. <laughs> and it's just a cool movie, okay? So pituitary giganticism, Andre the Giant, had a hypersecreting adenoma of the anterior pituitary gland, made excessive amounts of growth hormone, and insulin-like growth factor. Why insulin-like growth factor? What's so important about IGF-1? So this is one of the primary mediators of growth hormone because insulin-like growth factor systemically binds. It causes muscle, cartilage, bone, liver, kidney, nerves, skin, lungs, all of these structures to respond more aggressively to insulin which encourages the cells to uptake sugar. Now the cells have more energy, so metabolism can be higher, right? So if you have growth hormone, plus you have IGF-1, not only is the organism growing larger, but the cells that are in the muscle, bone, and tissues have more energy to do the activities. You kind of need the two. It's the metabolic facilitator of growth hormone. Um, <clears throat> These patients end up being um, what we call hyperinsulinemia. Um, so in, in this particular situation with hyperinsulinemia, um, they tend to develop type two diabetes mellitus. Um, because growth hormone uh, in excess inhibits peripheral glucose uptake, you end up becoming a little resistant to insulin and that's why they become hyperinsulinemia. We'll talk more about type 2 diabetes on, on Wednesday, um, but this picture of this gentleman, which you'd never be able to recognize if he walked in the door because his eyes are boxed out, um, is an example of pituitary giganticism. Now, acromegaly. This bottom image, working from your left, okay, over to your right, so we're going from the bottom left over, is the same woman over time as she's gotten older. But her adenoma of her pituitary gland happened post-adolescence. And so if pituitary giganticism, you've got an adenoma at a young age, your growth plates are still open. And so bone and bone can respond. Well, because growth hormone and IGF-1 are globally responsive. If it's post-adolescence and your growth plates have closed, you get some deformations that take place. And so post-adolescence, when there's an adenoma um, of the pituitary gland, you have excessive growth hormone production, you can get manifestations called acromegaly. And so now you see this patient moving from the lower left to the right in an acromegaly situation because the, the lesion developed when she was um, post adolescence. So this acromegaly um, uh, individual, um, you've got uh, you know, the cheekbones and the forehead become more enlarged, the jaw enlarges. I would say that this gentleman up top has some examples of acromegaly because he's got a very prominent jaw. He's got frontal bossing of the, of the forehead. Um, but with excessive growth hormone, like in females, you get more masculizing masculinizing characteristics. And so it's exaggerated in a woman on the lower panel of images. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, a lesion that wouldn't affect growth hormone. So there were times, let me back up, there were times where athletes were known to be supplementing with growth hormone. 
You think that's a good idea? It's a little dangerous, is all I'm going to say. Okay? Uh, so I'll leave it at that, because now you guys are educated and educate others. Well, we know that um, prolactin could also be the hormones affected. Maybe it's not growth hormone. Maybe it's another one of the anterior pituitary. So this particular example tends to be the most commonly seen tumor that hormonally active is a prolactinoma. It's actually not pituitary gigantism or pituitary atromegaly. It's actually a prolactinoma. And so in this picture, let me dim the lights here. Um, in, in this picture, you can actually appreciate on the right image with this MRI that's actually been pseudocolored where this prolactinoma is. Here it is right here, okay? Um, and, and you're noticing that the optic nerve here is actually elevated. They're highlighting this for you so you can actually um, draw your attention to it. So in women with a prolactinoma, because prolactin induces breast tissue development in milk production and it suppresses ovarian cycles because if you're releasing prolactin as a female, it means you're probably pregnant. So you're not gonna, you're not gonna go through a menstrual cycle because you're already pregnant. You're gonna save that biological energy for the developing embryo, okay? So about 30% of the pituitary tumors that we get in our patient population are this type. It's the most common. If you have high serum levels of prolactin in women, you get two conditions, uh, galactorurea and amenorrhea. So galactorurea is the spontaneous flow of milk or milk lectin, even though you're not pregnant, or nursing. And then amenorrhea is the absence of a menstrual cycle. Okay, so that's what happens in females that have a tumor of the anterior pituitary that's making functional prolactin. Now in men, it gets a little bit more interesting. Um, it becomes like feminizing for men. So you've got this situation of oligospermia, a reduced libido, and then erectile dysfunction. So oligospermia is you've got semen with a low concentration of sperm. So they still have ejaculate, but um, the um, number of cells that are present that are sperm are low. And then number two is sexual uh, drive goes down, reduced libido, and uh, erectile dysfunction. All right, so these are hyper. Let's talk briefly about hypo. And with hypo, the situation could happen where you've got um, an infarction, and now you do trauma to the anterior pituitary. You could have a um, traumatic brain injury, a TBI, car accident infections or surgical trauma. There are patients that go in, uh, surgeons will come in and they'll remove a tumor of the anterior pituitary. They take that healthy margin that we drew up here, and now all of a sudden they've caused some lesions and trauma to other parts of the pituitary, and now they're hypopituitary because they took away healthy tissue. So surgical trauma as a result of excising a tumor could lead to hypopituitarism. And then an interesting situation known as Sheehan syndrome. Sheehan syndrome is during pregnancy, the anterior pituitary increases in size. You guys didn't know this, but women, when they're pregnant, their brain gets bigger. The anterior pituitary enlarges, okay? Careful, men. Women are smarter than us, okay? In pregnancy, the anterior pituitary gland enlarges because it's a hormonal activity center, and so it is perfused with a higher amount of blood flow. And then after pregnancy, if there's a lot of blood that's lost during delivery, you could actually cause an infarction of the pituitary because it was re requiring so much blood flow and now you just had hemor hemorrhage happening during delivery. A lot of blood being lost during delivery. The enlarged pituitary is at risk of becoming ischemic or infarcted and that's known as Sheehan syndrome. So it's a postpartum pituitary infarction 
that occurs due to vasospasms of those arteries that recently developed. Yes, All right, the last slide that I'm going to talk about, and we'll pick up here, but I want to introduce it, okay? And it's important that you hang for just an extra 60 seconds if you can. Diabetes insipidus is posterior pituitary. The reason this is important to talk about today is I had to get this far because we're going to, we're going to talk about diabetes mellitus on Wednesday, and I want to have two different lectures so you don't mix them up. This is not diabetes mellitus. This is diabetes insipidus, which is of the posterior pituitary. Diabetes insipidus. So diabetes insipidus in Latin is siphoning, right, without taste. Siphoning without taste. Siphoning diabetes and without taste, insipidus. It's referring to water. And the other one is sugar, so we'll look at that. Hypo-antidiuretic hormone secretion. So what ends up happening is you lose too much water in your urine. Because the posterior pituitary, if there's a lesion in the posterior pituitary, it's not making enough vasopressin, or it's not making enough, another word for it is antidiuretic hormone, then you urinate and you lose a lot of your water. You don't concentrate your urine. Okay, so that's why in the, in, in the, in the Latin we say siphoning without taste because everything is diluted. You with me? So they knew it was a water issue. They're pretty smart. So we've got three symptoms. We've got polydipsia, excessive thirst, which would make sense. We've got polyuria, excessive urination, which makes sense. And then we've got hypernatremia, hypernatremia, the third blank. This is elevated sodium in the blood. Because if you lose a lot of water and you leave the sodium back, now your blood is hypernatremia. Two causes, two causes of diabetes insipidus. Neurogenic is the most common form, and neurogenic is referring to an issue with the brain due to a lack of ADH or vasopressin, usually because there's an infarction, a stroke, or if there's an adenoma lesion, bless you. Nephrogenic is less common, and it deals with the kidneys. That's why it's called nephrogenic. And, and usually those are patients that are in end-stage renal failure. Nephrogenic, okay? Thank you for hanging on a little bit longer. It's for your benefit because on Wednesday, I don't want to talk about this one. I want to talk about the other one. You guys with me? Okay. I'll see you guys Wednesday.